All right, um, today's model is uh, random forest. It's an even more complicated compound model. Um, it make lots and lots of models and um, rather than trying to find the one that works best, it tries to look across all the models to see what they find in common. Um, first though, we're gonna talk about um, bagging and um, bagging just stands for bootstrap aggregating. So aggregating is just smushing things together. Bootstrapping is the thing I'm gonna talk about now. So um, bootstrapping is a way to use a single data set to simulate the variability in a population. So um, it's actually a cool idea in its own right. And back when I went to school in the 90s, it was sort of um, a cutting edge technique. And so it lays underneath uh, this idea of random forests along with cart trees and regression and a bunch of other things um, that we're doing. So um, back when you were in intro stats or whatever, um, one of your ideas was that you took a sample of data and you wanted to use it to try to understand or estimate or explain or predict what happens in a larger population. For the most part, that's what statistics is. Um, you wanna look at past sales data to predict future sales data. You wanna look at past weather to predict future, future weather. Um, we look at a survey, not because we care specifically what those thousand people are gonna say, but what they tell us about what everyone else is gonna say. What will a future customer, a future voter um, think about um, as they're doing that. Um, when you click on something online, we want to be able to predict what you might want to do in the future, especially with regards to will you buy things or will you click on future things. Um, so all of that uses a sample to try to make guesses or estimates about the population. And we use the word statistic as a way um, to really think about that. Um, in all cases, samples are flawed um, imperfect things. At best, they're representative of the population so that we would say that the population resembles them. But they never get to the whole depth and breadth of an entire population. If you did, then you'd have the whole population and we call that a census, not a sample. So the question is, how much can we really predict uh, from the statistic? And if you remember from your intro stats class, we talked about the central limit theorem and the idea that things start to look normal after a while. And bootstrapping takes that idea to the extreme. So the idea is, what if we pull a sample from our sample? So instead of treating our sample as a sample of the future data we have, we instead treat it as a population of the data we have. So um, imagine all of our points, here's a little small sample around here, 22, 25, 18, right? Here's our average. The margin of error we could figure out, but with a sample that small, it's probably not gonna be very good. So what we instead do is we imagine that those points are bingo balls and we pull from them um, over and over again to try to get um, a larger sample. So uh, I'm going to go to a different web page. Uh, this is actually called a uh, stat key and a uh, stat key is part of a stat book that we don't use here at Truman. Um, but the idea is that a bootstrap sample is um, a cool idea. So here I'll show you our data table. So this data is 50, uh, 500, um, Atlanta commuters, and they were just asked how long it takes them to commute. So here it is in minutes, so 60 minutes is an hour. Um, you can see some people have short commutes, some people have long commutes, but 500 is a pretty nice sample. Um, but what you see when you look at this little display of the original sample right here is that it's not very normal, and we're not very sure that it could be um, analyzed as though it were normal. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna treat this 500 as a population that we're gonna draw from. So we're gonna generate one bootstrap sample by taking all 500 points, imagining them on little bingo balls, putting them in a bucket and drawing out. Now what's different than bingo is that instead of being able to only pull a number once, as soon as we draw it, we put it back in the bucket so you can pick it multiple times. So our bootstrap sample is going to have 500 uh, samples in it, but some of them are gonna be the same ones drawn multiple times and others won't be drawn at all. So on this table, and I know it's a little small, there were two high points here at 181 and 180, and you can see that the 181 point was pulled, but the 180 point was not pulled. And the same is true here. Some of these are actually a little higher than they were before, but they overall generally follow the same shape that we had before. Now, the other point you saw that got put over here is 28.8.8, which is the sample mean of our bootstrap sample. So that is our true mean from our real popular, or from our sample was 29.11, and 28.8 is close, but a little different than the mean of our new sample. 
Now, if we were doing that by hand, it would take us, what, a whole hour probably to do that once. You could imagine putting all the little things on little pieces of paper or bingo balls, sticking them in a bucket and drawing them out 500 times, throwing them back in. Well, of course, with computers, that goes quickly. So now we can generate another sample. And if you look down here as we do that, now we've pulled a second sample. And you can see it's a little bit different. If you want to, you can stop the tape and go back and see. And you can see how the mean changes. Our second mean is close, but a little bit different. 848 and 828 is our mean. And the standard deviation is a little bit different. Here you can see how the two samples look different. But we don't want to do that. We're going to make 100 of them. Or we're going to make 1,000 of them. And so what we've done is each one of these dots is the mean from one of these bootstrap samples. And each bootstrap sample has a different thing. Again, doing that by hand would be ridiculous. But doing it on the computer um, doesn't take very long to do. And we can do this a couple times, three, um, four, five times. So we've now made 5,000 samples of 500 points each. We recorded the mean from each one of them. And you can see as I scroll my cursor around, um, we can figure that out. Now, what makes bootstrap statistics sort of interesting is we can now take that and we could make a confidence interval on it. So instead of using the central limit theorem and T and all those things you learn, we could make a confidence interval just by looking at our 5,102 samples. I, that's just a number because I clicked on that many. And we want to find 95% of the points fall in the middle. And to get 95% in the middle, we put 2.5% on each end. And once we make the plot, we just count in, don't, 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 until we get to where we want to go. So our 95% uh, estimate of the mean is, uh, right, 29.138 is our uh, estimated mean, and 27.392 and 31 would be the ends of our confidence intervals. And we didn't do anything with T, we didn't look anything up on a table. All we did was we took these bootstrap samples lots and lots and lots of lots of times. So finding out where this is gives us a different way to think about <laughs> excuse me, a confidence interval. So this bootstrapping idea, we can uh, take to an extreme and the whole field of Bayesian statistics um, really builds off this or when you hear people talk about Monte Carlo um, markup chains and other kind of uh, cool modern techniques, this is what they're doing on the inside and random forest is just kind of a simple one of those. Um, before we get back to the slides, I just want to take another digression and look at 538.com. Now, 538.com you may have heard of. Um, Nate Silver is sort of a statistics uh, rock star right now. And um, what he does is he uses the same idea of bootstrap predictions, um, both to predict political events and to predict sports events. So what I pulled up here is just um, baseball predictions. So you can uh, look here. And what he does is he takes each game that's coming up here. So um, Thursday's game is the Astros and the Rangers. And uh, using their team rating and adjusting for a couple extra things, he gets this uh, fancier rating. So these are ELO ratings. You, you people talk about chess or other kind of uh, competitive sports. And they turn that into a percent chance of winning that game. And um, he does that for every game looking forward. And again, he takes that uh, to the extreme, again, to a level that would be hard to do um, if you were doing that. So for an individual prediction, you can see uh, one of the things that I think is sort of interesting is that even when a pretty good team plays a not so good team, right, there's still a 30% chance that that team wins. <clears throat> so anyway, what he does is he puts that together to simulate the entire season. So what he does is he simulates every game, just like we did with the uh, bootstrap confidence interval, 10,000 times to make 10,000 seasons of games of all the games that are left. And using those ratings, he then gets predictions about in how many of those simulated seasons though do the Yankees make the playoffs. And you can see it takes it to an extreme degree. You can split up by division if you want and see how the different teams are doing. Uh, here's the Cardinals and the Cubs, which lots of you care about. Um, and you can see that even though their predictive score is only a little bit different, their uh, rating, um, based off their current uh, game and the literal games they have left in the season, he has predictions about the chances of each one of them making the playoffs. And you can see he's not very bullish on the Cardinals right now. There are a couple of games below 500. Um, and you look at the Royals the same way, of course, they're not doing so well this year. 
So he does the same thing for politics, which I'm not going to talk about today because I want you all to still like me. But right, each one of those decisions is a kind of coin flip. It's a binomial prediction um, that each game has a prediction of the team. So he flips that metaf metaphorical coin to get all the results of the games all the way for what's left in the season. And then he uses that to build entire standings and predictions. So again, the idea that the Yankees and the Dodgers are predicted to be the two best teams right now. Um, and you can see actually that um, it gets to be a pretty complicated model pretty quickly, even though each stage is actually a really simple thing, equivalent to putting balls in a bingo uh, bucket to see what's going on. Um, and like I said, they do the same thing for politics and pretty soon he'll come up with his uh, Senate and presidential models and those are pretty interesting um, to look at. All right, so back to the slides and this idea of bootstrapping is what makes random forest work when combined with the other ideas that we had. So for instance, here are some points we have. So um, again, here are um, whatever it is, I think 10 points that we've uh, put on there and we're just going to sample different numbers of points. So here you can see we picked 10 three times, but we didn't pick uh, point number one at all. And we repeat that lots and lots of times. So if we look at our um, predictions, we can then go ahead and pick some of them this time and make a regression line that fits them and then take a second sample that's a little bit different. And you can see the line moved each time. And now we do it a third time based off of those uh, predictions. And we can do this as many times as we want. And after we make a whole bunch of them, what you see is we get a whole bunch of lines that look like this. And you can see some of the lines are way off the others, but a lot of them just fall on top of each other. And then based off of that, we can then find the average of our regression lines and use that to make a prediction. Again, if you're trying to imagine the algebra, right, that's pretty gigantic and hard to imagine. But for a computer, it's just doing it one time and then doing it again and then doing it more times and then taking the average of all that. We can combine that with classification trees. So if our full data uh, gave us a tree that looked like that, we could then pull different bootstrap samples, different bags to make different trees that look different. Now, one of the things we find is that each one of those has a different error. And from those, we can look together and see which ones will work the best. Now, if we do this with just straight bagging, it works pretty well. It actually produces a predictor that has less variance. And when your data is not very linear, this sort of model often produces a predictor that works even better. Now, rather than doing cross-validation like we did before, we can produce a thing called out of bag error. So what we do is we take the data points we picked, um, make our model, and then we see how well that model works on the points that we didn't pick. So this out of bag error, which the cool kids call oob, um, just because you can, um, figures out how that works. So out of bag error gives you a different sort of measure like root mean squared error, but it builds in that extra uh, thing and then we can also calculate the root mean squared error from that um, out of bag. So in our case, each of the um, points is used. We calculate our prediction. So for each data point that's out, we see how well it's predicted. We see how far off each one is. We get the residuals for there, just like we did in a regression. And what we find is that um, bootstrapping linear projections work best when your predictors do not actually follow a good linear model. And um, what we find is that the trees come out even better if each of the trees is structurally different. And so now we get to the point where it, we really make a forest. So what we're going to do is in order to get different trees so that we can build stronger models, we're going to do bootstrapping, but in a different kind of way. Um, so rather than just picking across the um, samples, we're going to do the same thing where we're going to pick across the variables. So if you imagine we have whatever our 500 data points and we have all of our different columns, we can go ahead and um, do bootstrapping on the sample. So we get a new sample 
and then we just pick a subset of variables um, to work on. So at each branch of our tree, instead of looking at all of the variables, we're going to pick a random subset of them. Um, unlike bootstrapping, we can't pick the same variable multiple times, but we could pick, say, three out of our 10 variables and see how it goes. So for instance, if we do our wine quality model, um, here is uh, one uh, tree that is made based off of that. And what we do is at each branch, we only pick three variables and then it picks the one that splits the best using regular classification trees like we talked about before, makes the two parts, and then we pick three variables at each step. And what we can see is we got the data split pretty nicely there. But now we can go ahead and do it again, but now we're gonna pick different variables and we're gonna pick different uh, bootstrap sample to start with. And now we're gonna get a very different tree. Again, each tree is sort of time consuming to make by hand, but for computers, we can make lots and lots of trees very quickly. So um, what we find is if we do a multiple regression in the regular way, we get an uh, error of 0.65. If we do a cart on the same analysis, right, it was actually a little bit worse. This was from the data we did uh, last week. But if we do a random forest, we get an error that's lower. And even if we look at the out of bag, meaning that we're not using the points themselves to predict the error, we're finding that the error is much better. So uh, random forests really um, provide a little bit of magic um, in the sense that we're sampling in two different directions. We're making random samples, we're picking random variables, and then we're making a bunch of trees off of that. All right, a couple other surprising things. As we make more trees, random forests get more accurate. But what we find is, is that after a while, um, it doesn't get more better. So you would think, oh, let's just make tons and tons of trees. But what we find is that 500 trees isn't actually much better than 100 trees as we make a model to do that. Um, there are tuning parameters that we can go in and play with. Um, one of them is m try, which is how many variables we pick at each point. Um, n try is how many we pick for the sample uh, bootstrap. And what we see is if we try it with different numbers of variables in this particular round, we got totally weird errors. Because they are random, if we did them multiple times, um, you can see that we get different uh, things. The idea that we're going to find a perfect forest is not really a thing because each one of them is random, each one is going to have variability. So instead of um, calculating more trees, we might want to do more repetition. So typically we would calculate 500 trees 10 times and look across all of those models. In this particular case, we did it two times, but we also did it across different numbers of variables. But what you can see here is that one variable and two variable got better and better and three got better, but after that it kind of wiggled around. So there's really no reason to use more than three variables. Remember this original one had um, 11 variables to start with and actually some people think um, the square root of the number of variables is a good number, but you can also fiddle with it. Now, lastly, this demonstration was about regression variables, but we could do the same thing for classifications. So um, if we did the same random forest um, with that categorical versions of the wine data, um, what we get at the end is a confusion matrix, which we talked about before. So Along the top is um, what was um, predicted and along the side is what we actually had. And what we see is that random forests are actually not very good for our extreme data points. So in fact, the variables that, uh, I'm sorry, the wines that were quality three, so the lousy wines, there were 10 of them and the model didn't predict any of them to be a zero, a three. Instead, they rated them all better. This is because random forests do tend to smush towards the middle. So um, the fact that it had every one of them wrong, the same was true for four. And if we look down here at eight, you can see that of the ones that had an eight, two were correctly classified as an eight and the rest were classified as a six or seven. What that means is that random forests aren't really good if what you're looking for is extremes. So if you're looking for uh, the safety of your nuclear plant, uh, Random forests probably aren't what you want to do because you only have three uh, data points to look at ahead of time. However, this kind of rich middle is where a lot of data lives and where a lot of predictive elements go. If you're someone who goes to Amazon and only likes to buy blue books rather than, you know, you're a person who likes science fiction book or a person who likes romance novels or a person who likes historical books, 
Amazon's going to do a lousy job predicting you because most of the people that are in its sample, it turns out like kinds of books, not colors of books. Um, and random forests are literally what works inside of predictive models like Netflix and Amazon. So when Amazon has those list of items you might also want to buy, that uses a random forest. Netflix, when it says what show you might want to watch next or what are in your top picks, it's using a random forest. Again, the idea that there's a perfect model isn't what they are going for. They want a really fast model because it's computing those for thousands of people every minute. Um, Amazon and uh, Netflix are making slightly more complicated models because they can use your past results as well as other people's past results. And so they can kind of mix them together in a little bit different way. But it literally is doing random forests in that case. So, um, if you want a model that works, random forest really is the best one, which is why it's sort of the peak of what we're doing here in this class, um, because it gives good results and it's what's used. Um, again, there are ways to make them fancier, ways to make them more complicated, but um, random forests are really a great uh, method we could use.